Hi, it's Katrina. Kassar Dra. A Kassar is a North African term for a fortified desert village in the middle of nowhere. It's typically used in reference to a settlement belonging to the Berbers, an ethnic group which is indigenous to the region. Kassars are commonly seen across the Maghreb region, which includes Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. One known as Kassar Dra is reportedly in Timimun, Algeria, although information about it is scarce online making it even more mysterious than most. Most Kassars are mysterious by default because of their placement in the middle of the desert on purpose. They function as oases, as places of relief from the unforgivingly harsh and arid climate, and are often known for their unique and beautiful architecture. In the Maghreb, Kassars often consist of attached houses, as well as a mosque, bath, oven, and other structures. They're typically made from adobe and are characterized by a single continuous wall. While most Kassars are located in the Sahara, some can be found in the mountains. Detectives on Reddit, trying to figure these places out, propose the possibility that round Kassars like the one in this picture were built by ancient Jewish kingdoms, while Muslim Kassars were supposedly in the shape of a polygon with five sides. While it's true that there were significant Jewish communities throughout the Maghreb, it's hard to verify whether they built any Kassars or which ones. To make things even more confusing, the Berbers were originally a Jewish people. At some point in time, most of them converted to Islam, although some chose to remain Jewish. Most modern-day Berbers are Sunni Muslim, although some are practitioners of other factions of Islam. Today, there are an estimated 8,000 descendants of Berber Jews living in modern-day Morocco. Rupkund There are as many as 800 skeletons at Rupkund Lake. Also known as Skeleton Lake, it is located 16,500 feet above sea level in the Indian Himalayas. Measuring 130 feet across and about 10 feet deep, this glacial lake is beautiful, but it is also littered with human remains that have accumulated over hundreds, if not thousands of years. Why do so many people die here? The human remains are only visible during the one month of the year that it thaws. In addition to the multitude of bones, the site contains iron spearheads, leather slippers, wooden items, and rings. Until recently, the origins of the human remains at Rukkand were unknown. Reports of the skeletons date as far back as the 9th century, but the site wasn't rediscovered until 1942. Researchers have been baffled by the site ever since. They initially assumed that everybody had died at the same time in a single catastrophic event about 1,000 years ago. But a new study that came out in 2019 is telling an entirely different and infinitely more confusing story. Experts performed a DNA analysis on 38 of the individuals found at Rupkund. They identified 23 males and 15 females, who died over a roughly 1,000-year span. The findings completely upend the theory that a single tragic event killed everyone. 23 people who died or were buried in the lake between the 7th and 10th centuries were found to be of South Asian ancestry. Between the 17th and 20th centuries, the remains of 14 individuals of Eastern Mediterranean ancestry and one person of East Asian ancestry died at Rupkund. People from all over came here and apparently risked their lives. Scientists have not yet identified any causes of death, but it's probably more than safe to say that not everyone died from the same cause. One huge lingering question is how and why people of Eastern Mediterranean descent ended up at the lake. They certainly weren't Hindu pilgrims, yet Rupkund is located along a major pilgrimage route. Like many studies, these findings pose more questions than answers. Las Lunas Mystery Stone 35 miles south of Albuquerque in the remote desert of west-central New Mexico, a large boulder sits on the side of a mountain bearing inscriptions in a language that nobody understands. It goes by several names, including the Los Lunas Mystery Stone, the Decalogue Stone, and the Commandments Rock. The boulder appeared in literature for the first time in 1933, when archaeologist Frank Hibben wrote about seeing it while on a tour. The tour leader claimed to have discovered the boulder during the 1880s, but nobody knows for sure when people first learned about it. Hibben claimed that the text was pre-Columbian, but his credibility was called into question when it became evident that he changed some of his archaeological data to fit his theories. That's convenient. Others have suggested that the text is Paleo-Hebrew or Cypriotic Greek. 
The 80-ton boulder has never been studied in a lab because of how difficult it would be to move. And people have cleaned the inscriptions many times over the years, complicating the possibility of an accurate scientific analysis. But studying the stone academically could prove to be a colossal waste of time anyway, if you ask some people, who believe that it's a hoax created by Hibben himself. And maybe he never even found anything to begin with. Uluru Also known as Ayers Rock, Uluru is a large, isolated sandstone formation in Australia's Northern Territory. It's located 208 miles from the nearest large town of Alice Springs and is surrounded by watering holes, springs, rock caves, and ancient artwork. Measuring 1,142 feet high with a perimeter of 5.8 miles, it's certainly a sight to behold. Uluru is one of Australia's most sacred and important Aboriginal sites. To scientists, it's a fascinating geological feature known as an Inselberg, or an island mountain. Inselbergs are usually found in dry, flat regions and are characterized by an isolated knob or a hill that juts out from the land below it. The massive formation started out as sand, which condensed to form sandstone. The layers of sand were deposited horizontally between 300 and 400 million years ago. They were turned nearly vertical during a later episode of mountain building. Uluru was once home to 46 known native mammal species. That number has dropped to 21 and includes seven bat species. There are six invasive creatures at the site, including mice, camels, foxes, cats, dogs, and rabbits. Activists are campaigning for the reintroduction of locally extinct animals, such as the rufous hare wallaby, the bilby, the mallee fowl, the common brush-tailed possum, burrowing betong, and the black-flanked rock wallaby. There are many Aboriginal myths and legends tied to Uluru, including creation stories and stories about the area still being inhabited by ancestral spiritual beings. One tale claims that two boys were playing in the mud after a rainfall. Then they began to fight, and their bodies were preserved as large boulders. In another story, serpent beings engaged in harsh warfare around Uluru, resulting in the scarring of the rock that is visible today in the form of cracks and crevices. Visitors are cautioned against taking rocks or other souvenirs at the risk of becoming cursed and suffering severe misfortune. Many people claim to have learned this lesson the hard way, with some even mailing back their mementos in hopes of reversing the alleged curse. Do you believe you can get cursed by taking something from a famous site? Let me know in the comments! Washwood Settlement Wash Woods was a small settlement on a barrier island along the southeastern Virginia coast. Legend claims that a group of shipwreck survivors established the town centuries ago after abandoning their vessel and wading ashore. But the origins of Wash Woods are largely shrouded in mystery. Several of the settlement's buildings, including a Methodist church, were built with cypress wood from a schooner that ran aground in 1895. By 1900, Wash Woods contained a school, two churches, a life-saving station, and a grocery store. Its population peaked at around 300 residents, who worked as farmers, fishermen, hunting guides, and lifesavers who helped save people from other wrecked ships. Life wasn't easy here. Throughout its entire existence, the town encountered severe weather, which often saw the land inundated with ocean water. Moreover, with no roads in or out of the settlement, Washwoods was rather isolated. By the 1920s, the area was being flooded so often that people began to leave. In 1933, a destructive Category 4 hurricane pushed any remaining residents out. Today, the ruins are part of False Cape State Park. All that's left of Washwoods are the steeple from the Methodist Church, a small cemetery, and the former Coast Guard station. Would you want to live in an isolated town on a barrier island? Do you know of any other areas along the coast of the US or other countries with similar settlements? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. We've got lots more videos coming up. Ancient Rock Art Canadian archaeologist Ernie Walker has been studying the Nuo Asiniac site north of Saskatoon since the early 1980s when he first found bones and other artifacts there. For some reason, it seemed like he just somehow knew that there were valuable discoveries waiting to be made. He carried his work on into the present day, and it's paid off immensely. Last year, 
archaeologists found four petroglyphs at the site, which is now a park. One of the pieces, called a rib stone, is a 500-pound stone that was carved to resemble an animal's rib. Another, weighing 750 pounds, bears a grid-like pattern. The largest of the four is a boulder that weighs 1,200 pounds, which hasn't been removed from the ground yet. Walker also found a rare stone knife beside the rocks. The petroglyphs probably date back to a culture and time that predates the arrival of Europeans to the Americas, according to Walker. But who actually found this? He credits a bison herd that lives on the parkland. After the animals kicked up some dirt one day, Walker noticed the top of a boulder poking out of the ground. He says if it weren't for them, he may not have ever found the ancient rock art at all. The Katsuki Pillar One of the world's most sacred and isolated churches sits atop the Katsuki Pillar, a 130-foot-tall limestone monolith in the country of Georgia. There are no trains to this far-flung destination, which sits 125 miles west of the capital of Tbilisi. The only options for getting there are by either driving or taking a bus, followed by a 20-minute hike and a climb up a steep, half-finished staircase to the monastery at the base of the pillar. The church that sits atop the massive rock column was built between the 9th and 10th centuries in dedication to Maximus the Confessor, a 7th century Christian monk who was known for his controversial views. In addition to the church, the site consists of a burial chamber, a wine cellar, and three hermit chambers. Only monks are allowed to make the 20-minute climb up the thin metal ladder to the top, which they do daily because they like to pray where they feel closer to God. By banning the public from accessing the site, the monastery physically protects the buildings and also preserves their holiness. Monks lived at the site starting in the 10th or 11th century, but none live there now. Visitors are also not allowed inside the ground-level monastery, but there are other buildings that they can explore. While there's an unavoidable mysteriousness that comes along with not being able to see what's on top of Katsuki Pillar firsthand, the monks walk the grounds freely. They are happy to speak with guests, and there is a lot to learn from them. Strange Stone Balls Hundreds of polished stone balls dating back to the Neolithic era have been found throughout Scotland and the Orkney Islands, as well as England, Ireland, and Norway. Some are covered in protrusions, others are carved with ornate designs, and some are simply polished smooth. It took experts a long time to figure out what the balls were probably used for. At first, they assumed the spheres were weapons, but now they think that the balls were artistic and that they perhaps symbolized someone's social ranking or were used to mark an important part of their life. In September, archaeologists discovered two polished stone balls on the island of Sande in the Orkney archipelago. They were found in tombs along with several ancient knives that may have been used for ritually cutting the remains of the dead. Dating back roughly 5,500 years, one of the spheres is made from black stone and the other is made from lighter colored limestone. They are simpler than some of the elaborately decorated spheres that came later on in the Neolithic era, as archaeologist Vicky Cummings pointed out in a life science interview, but they are beautiful nonetheless. The Eye of the Sahara Nicknamed the Eye of the Sahara, the Richat structure is an eroded geological dome located on the Adrar Plateau in Mauritania. Measuring 25 miles in diameter, it exposes layers of igneous and sedimentary rock, which are arranged in concentric circles. The rocks near the center of the bullseye formation are older than the outer layers, and layers that were once connected have been separated by visible shifting faults. The Richat structure can be seen from space, and early astronauts used it as a geographical marker while passing over the Sahara. There are only 3.7 million people living in Mauritania. Most of them reside along the Atlantic coast, roughly 300 miles from the eye of the Sahara. The remote geological oddities' origins have long been a topic of debate. Scientists originally believed it was an impact crater of some sort, perhaps created by a space object that crashed into the Earth. But research from the 1950s and 60s indicated that the eye was formed by terrestrial processes. In other words, it was carved out by some earthly phenomenon or a thing rather than an object from space. A 2011 study concluded that low-temperature thermal waters were the force at play. 
Artifacts found around the structure's outermost depression consisted of simple hand tools that were used by our early hominid relative, Homo erectus. Scientists truly don't know much about the Raichat structure or its history of human use. They'll have to investigate more if they want to continue learning exactly what it is, how it formed, and any significance it may have had to early humans. The Ringed Lady of Herculaneum Of course you've heard of Pompeii, the ancient Roman city that was wiped out by a catastrophic volcanic eruption in 79 AD. But it wasn't the only city that was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius. The nearby city of Herculaneum was also completely destroyed, but the experience itself was much different. While it was much closer to the volcano than Pompeii was, Herculaneum avoided being rained on by debris for nearly a day after the eruption began. Residents had time to see what was happening and analyze the situation. They weren't vaporized in an instant, and so they had some time to plan their next move. Archaeologists initially found very few human remains at Herculaneum, so they assumed that most people escaped the disaster. Yet, as it turned out, they were wrong. In 1982, a team discovered piles of skeletons along the town's beach and in a series of vaulted chambers, and they believe that there may be even more bodies waiting to be discovered. But if the people of Herculaneum had any opportunity to escape, why didn't they? During the eruption's second phase, the volcanic cloud it created collapsed, resulting in deadly pyroclastic surges the first of which spewed forth at 100 feet per second. Anyone who wasn't gone from the town by then had little to no chance to leave, and they were either vaporized or buried. One of the most iconic individuals discovered at Herculaneum is the Ringed Lady. Also called the Lady of the Rings, she became famous for the elegant jewelry she was wearing when the eruption killed her. She was one of the first skeletons to make the news after the discoveries, and she remains fresh in people's minds today. Like many of the individuals found at Pompeii and Herculaneum, she serves as a sobering reminder of the trauma many people experienced firsthand during their final moments in the deadly shadow of Mount Vesuvius. A New Dinosaur Species Scientists in Missouri recently announced the discovery of a new dinosaur species and genus. Dubbed Parasaurus missouriensis, the creature was identified based on the skeleton of a juvenile found by paleontologist Guy Darrow. P. missouriensis was a duck-billed dinosaur that grew up to 35 feet long by adulthood. The recently unearthed specimen was roughly the size of a Volkswagen, according to Darrow, who has been working at the site for 40 years. Sea levels were much higher when the creature roamed the Earth around 70 million years ago. At the time, North America was divided by a body of water called the Western Interior Seaway. While a wealth of fossils have been found along what was once the former sea's western shore, the Missouri fossil site represents one of the few that would have been along the eastern shore. Kind of a west shore versus east shore situation. Pete Makovicki, curator of dinosaurs at Chicago's Field Museum, has explored dinosaur fossil sites all over the world. He described the Missouri property as one of the most unique he's ever seen. Researchers are now keeping the location a secret for now, while they work to secure the site, because they don't want anyone stealing their dino bones. They could be worth millions! Makovicki said that he believes there are more dinosaur fossils in the area waiting to be found. Given this new species discovery, it's possible there may be other undiscovered dinosaurs yet to be found in the area. Russian Silver Horde when people in southwestern Russia caught word of an impending Mongol invasion in 1237, they buried their treasure in secret hiding spots with plans to retrieve their valuables later on. But not everyone ended up coming back to the burial sites, and modern archaeologists have unearthed several of the hoards. But a recently discovered collection of over two dozen pieces of silver jewelry stood out as different from the rest. The hoard consists of over 5 pounds of silver, including 14 bracelets, 5 rings, 4 silver ingots, and more. Based on their style, the items appear to date back to the late 11th or early 12th century. There were no nearby settlements at the time, but the jewelry was found near a road that led to a major trading hub called Old Ryazan. It probably belonged to either a merchant or a thief, according to archaeologist Igor Strykalov, 
and could have bought at least 10 war horses or 200 sheep. That's quite a stash. Strykalov says that the horde's owner may have buried it out of fear and that the fears were justified. He could not return for the treasure since he probably died soon after. Sakaro Sodo Monoliths There are around 10,000 monoliths at Sakaro Sodo and several other archaeological sites throughout southern Ethiopia, with some standing as high as 20 feet tall. They are found in what's known as the Judeo Zone, which contains the largest number and highest concentration of megalithic steel monuments in Africa. These incredible monoliths vary in size, function, and arrangement. Many are shaped like a phallus. Some are plain, while others bear intricate faces or anthropomorphic designs. They haven't been studied much, and nobody knows how or why they were built. During the 1990s, French scientists concluded that the monuments date back to sometime around 1100 AD. But they were wrong, according to a recent study, which found that the monoliths are roughly 1,000 years older than scientists previously thought. After re-examining them, a team of researchers from Washington State University determined that they were likely built during the 1st century AD. They also found that most of the obsidian artifacts at Sakaro Sodo were created with rock sourced from 186 miles away in northern Kenya. Sadly, many of the monuments have fallen down or broken into pieces. They are currently under consideration as a prospective UNESCO World Heritage Site, which would afford them the protection they need to prevent time and the elements from destroying them completely. And now for a mysterious city that kept burning down. But first, want to give a big shout out to Jennifer Ballesteri and Austin Brown, who is a new subscriber. Welcome! If you want to see more videos about amazing and mysterious discoveries, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell for more videos like these. Burnt City Figurines Archaeologists in southwestern Iran's Burnt City recently announced the discovery of numerous human and animal figurines. Formerly known as Shar e Sukte, the ancient metropolis dates back roughly 5,000 years. From its founding in 3200 BC to its final downfall in 1800 BC, it was home to four different civilizations, all of which burned down in catastrophic fires. Incredible coincidence? Possibly but it does explain why the spot is known as the Burnt City. For some reason, every time the city burned down, a new one was built in its place. But what kept people coming back and rebuilding? The mysterious area was very popular, with various Bronze Age trade routes passing through. Within the remains of the Burnt City itself were the figurines. They consist of cows and other animals, as well as sitting women and standing men, according to archaeologist Hossein Maradi. Additionally, the team unearthed a kiln, but they don't yet know whether it was used for firing pottery, smelting metal, or for something else. Perhaps even more interesting, they found the remains of a prehistoric monkey, which they believe was kept as a pet. The animal's owner buried it inside its cage. Based on the Burnt City's trading connections, Researchers believe that the monkey was imported from northern India or Central Asia. Only 4-5% to of the burnt city has been excavated so far. Investigating is both time-consuming and expensive, and each digging season only lasts 60 days. The archaeology team recently began its 19th season in a residential part of the site. Their goal is to reach areas with artifacts left behind from the first period of occupation which they have found the least evidence of throughout the ongoing excavations. A Roman Crucifixion While excavating at a Roman settlement in Cambridgeshire, England in 2017, archaeologists found evidence of a crucifixion in the form of an ankle bone with a nail driven through the heel. The 1900-year-old skeleton belongs to a man who died between the ages of 25 and 35 years old. He was laid to rest with his arms crossed over his chest in one of five cemeteries that have been found near an ancient Roman settlement in Fenstanton. The burial seemed pretty ordinary at first. Field archaeologists bagged the bones without even noticing the nail through the man's heel. After taking a closer look, however, experts noticed the nail, which they recently described as the best physical evidence of a Roman crucifixion ever found. Project manager David Ingham told reporters that nothing quite like it has ever been found, so nobody was looking for the nail at first. In other words, it's understandable that it went unnoticed. 
It's true that crucifixion nails are a rare archaeological find, mainly because the punishment was often carried out using rope and because the victims rarely received a proper burial. Scientists examined the skeleton in detail and ruled out other possibilities, concluding that the Fenstanton man was, indeed, most likely crucified. He is a rare example of someone not only being crucified with nails rather than rope, but of a crucifixion victim being afforded a respectable burial. Nobody knows who he was or why he was put to death, although the practice was typically reserved for lower-class people, slaves, and rebels. There are only four known discoveries bearing physical evidence of crucifixion worldwide, and at least one of them is questionable in terms of its authenticity, making the Fenstanton Man one of the most remarkable archaeological finds from Roman England to date. Ancient Leather Armor In 2013, archaeologists found a nearly complete set of leather armor in a tomb in an extremely dry region of northwestern China. A team of experts from the University of Zurich recently examined the armor in detail. They determined that it was made sometime between the 6th and 8th centuries BC. It belonged to a warrior who rode a horse, and the owner died at around 30 years old. The 2,700-year-old armor originated in the Neo-Assyrian Empire, which encompassed Mesopotamia, the Levant, Egypt, and part of Anatolia. It was brought to China where it was buried in the warrior's grave near the modern-day city of Turfan. The recent analysis is helping researchers better understand the spread of military technology throughout the first millennium BC. They described the leather armor as acting like an extra layer of skin, which protected its wearer's vital organs during combat without making it difficult for the fighter to move. Armor was extremely valuable at the time because the materials were expensive and it was a lot of work to make. Wearing it was a privilege reserved for the elite, and warriors were rarely buried with it. But the use of leather, bronze, and iron made it more affordable and easier to get, enabling large ancient armies to gear up for battle. Ordinary soldiers of lower social rankings were able to fight efficiently, and as this discovery shows, they were even sometimes laid to rest with their armor. Blair Athelman Around 1,500 years ago, a 45-year-old man died and was buried in the Scottish Highlands. Construction workers discovered his skeleton in 1985 and called the police, who summoned archaeologists to the scene. Experts dated the remains to sometime between 400 and 600 AD, and they learned a few other interesting things about him as well. Nicknamed the Blair Athelman after his final resting place, he spent the last five to ten years of his life subsisting on pork, freshwater fish, and waterfowl. He ate a similar diet to others who lived in the area at the time, initially leading researchers to believe that he was a local. But a recent analysis detected an unusually high amount of sulfur in his remains compared to others in the area, indicating that the Blair Athel man wasn't a local after all. He likely spent a good portion of his life along Scotland's western coast and probably arrived in the Highlands shortly before he died. Scientists think that he may have grown up in one of the Hebrides Islands, or that he might have even come from Ireland. This and other recent discoveries add to a growing body of evidence that people traveled great distances throughout Scotland during the early medieval period. Researcher Kate Britton, who co-authored a study on the topic, told journalists that these types of movements may have not been uncommon. She also explained that both men and women migrated between coasts and elsewhere, and that they probably had various reasons for making these journeys. Little else is known about the Blair Athel man, despite the new findings about his travels. He may have been a member of the Picts, an indigenous Celtic group of people who lived in modern-day eastern and northeastern Scotland during ancient times. Britain said that he was born in a remote area that wasn't yet a part of Pictish territory, yet he migrated to their region and was buried according to their funerary customs. The recent study was sparked by a local fascination with the Blair Athel man and a desire to know more about his life. Perhaps the strong public interest in his story will inspire more investigations. Golden-Tongued Mummies Archaeologists recently discovered two intriguing tombs at the El Banasa site, also known as Oxyrhynchus, in what was once Upper Egypt. They dated the burials to sometime between 688 and 525 BC, during Egypt's 26th dynasty. 
The era is also known as the Saite period and is named after Sais, which was the empire's capital city at the time. One of the burials consisted of a large limestone sarcophagus with a lid shaped like a woman. Unfortunately, the tomb was raided at some point during antiquity, so some things were missing by the time modern experts found it. Luckily, they discovered another ancient tomb nearby, which remained untouched. Inside it was a sarcophagus belonging to a man, along with over 200 artifacts, including amulets, beads, and figurines. Both mummies had golden tongues. You may be surprised to learn that it wasn't the first time that scientists discovered golden-tongued mummies. Earlier this year, a team unearthed 16 2,000-year-old burials containing poorly preserved mummies with gold foil amulets shaped like tongues in their mouths. The tongues were meant to enable people who had passed on to speak directly to Osiris, the god of the underworld and the judge of the dead. These particular discoveries were made in northern Egypt at the Taposiris Magna Temple in Alexandria, which isn't exactly near the more recently discovered golden tongue mummies, showing that the tradition was widespread. Space-time ripples Scientists have detected a record-smashing tsunami of gravitational waves. These gravitational waves are essentially ripples in the very fabric of space-time. According to scientists working at the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, at least 35 separate gravitational wave events were detected between November of 2019 and March of 2020. That's more than a third of all gravitational wave events detected prior to that. To understand this a bit better, Keep in mind that gravitational waves are created when two wildly dense objects become locked inside a binary orbit and then collide. For example, hugely dense celestial objects like a neutron star and a black hole. When these hugely powerful objects orbit one another, both of them accelerate at such blistering speeds they create waves that undulate space-time. When two black holes collide, or other similar events happen in space, cosmic ripples travel at the speed of light through the universe. So far, research indicates these waves of gravity don't have much of an impact on us. They simply show us what happened thousands or millions of light years away when a cataclysmic event took place. Scientists say that 32 out of the 35 new detections come from the merging of black holes. When two black holes spiral into each other, going faster and faster in tighter loops, they eventually combine into a massive, even more powerful black hole. Seeing as scientists detected this phenomenon 32 times in just a few months, that must mean that black holes are slamming into each other with a lot of frequency. Black Hole Neutrinos A very high-energy cosmic particle, something scientists call an electron antineutrino, was observed for the first time on our planet thanks to an international team of physicists from Penn State. The antineutrino is the twin to the neutrino, only in antimatter form. This mysterious and entirely invisible particle approached our planet from outer space a few years ago, on December 8th in 2016. It was traveling near the speed of light when it crashed into an ice sheet over the South Pole and collided with an electron there in the ice. This produced a heavily charged particle that decayed almost instantly into a shower of other particles. And while none of this might make much sense, the important thing to know is that the entire event was captured by the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. This observatory uses thousands of sensors stuck in the Antarctic ice to detect neutrinos. It's a huge telescope that most people don't even know exists. Its only purpose is to study neutrinos, the subatomic particles that perforate every inch of our universe, but that we know very little about. When these antineutrinos interact with normal neutrinos, they create new particles in a process called glashoresonance. But what's really interesting is that these antineutrinos are only formed when there is significant energy to make them. The amount of energy needed for one of these particles is over 1,000 times more than what the Large Hadron Collider can produce. Nothing on Earth can make these particles, which is why scientists believe the particle came from a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy 3.7 billion light years away. UFO in Rome In the city of Rome, Italy, a UFO was seen by a startling number of people. One particular family was looking out the window of their house when they saw a bright light shining on the horizon. 
The light looked yellow. It appeared to be a perfectly circular ball, and suddenly it began to move. It shot up into the sky, flew into space, and disappeared from view. Amazingly, the family managed to catch the incident on video. It's about the clearest evidence that can be presented for a literal UFO sighting on our planet. If the light had been falling toward the surface, it would have been a different story. We could have blamed it on an asteroid, plane, a falling chunk of frozen something, really anything. But when a bright yellow ball of light goes the opposite way, back out into space, it really makes you wonder. What do you think it was? Let me know in the comments below. A mysterious burst from space. A fast radio burst has been detected near a small population of ancient stars. For those who need a refresher, fast radio bursts, or FRBs, are repeating bursts of energy that come from somewhere out in the universe. FRBs have been defying all explanations since they were discovered in 2007. The best guess scientists have is that they come from cosmic objects known as magnetars. A magnetar is a type of neutron star with an extraordinarily powerful magnetic field. The magnetic field of a magnetar is at least 1,000 times stronger than what you get with a normal neutron star, and over 1 trillion times stronger than Earth's own magnetic field. And for that reason, these types of stars are pretty good at sending out fast radio bursts. They are basically giant magnets more powerful than anything you can imagine. Just recently, a fast radio burst was traced back to its origin, to a globular cluster 11.7 million light years away from us in the spiral galaxy called M81. Brian Gainsler with the University of Toronto says the fast radio burst has no business in M81. The discovery has been compared to finding a smartphone buried in Stonehenge. This is because globular clusters are some of the oldest things in the universe, billions of years old. These clusters orbit galaxies, and they don't contain magnetars. So then where did the FRB come from? Scientists still aren't exactly sure. They believe the bursts of energy could have come from an evaporating black hole, a white dwarf, or something else we just haven't discovered yet. Iapetus Iapetus was discovered 350 years ago in 1671. If you've never heard of it before, don't worry, you're not the only one. It's a lesser-known celestial object, one of the moons of Saturn that has a name kind of complicated so people don't really remember it. And even though it was discovered hundreds of years ago, it still hasn't been completely explained by scientists. We have to go back to Italy when Giovanni Cassini, who was already well aware that Saturn possessed at least one giant moon called Titan, discovered Iapetus. But after he discovered it the first time, he lost it for 30 years until he got an upgraded telescope and saw it once again. The little moon was already a mysterious troublemaker. We know a lot more today than we did back then, like the fact that Saturn is a world made up of gas. We also know it has eight moons outside of its rings, with Iapetus being the furthest away. But Iapetus has a few other weird features. It doesn't orbit on the same plane as the other moons. It orbits the planet at an odd angle, and it also has an abnormally shaped equator and is two different colors. One of the hemispheres is a reddish-brown color, while the other side is white as snow. Scientists are still working on figuring out why out of all the moons in our solar system, Iapetus seems to be the most unusual. Do you have a favorite moon? Let me know in the comments below! And now possibly the first exoplanet in another galaxy! But first, want to give a big shout out to Henry and Mari Love. Thanks so much for supporting Origins Explained! If you are new here, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more amazing discoveries! The Whirlpool Galaxy Astronomers have discovered what could be the very first exoplanet ever detected in a different galaxy. This potential exoplanet, M51 ULS 1b, is approximately 28 million light years away from us in the spiral galaxy M51. It's also sometimes known as the Whirlpool Galaxy. According to Roseanne Di Stefano, an astrophysicist at Harvard University involved in the discovery, scientists are working right now to find as many new worlds as possible. And to do this, astronomers used the Chandra X-ray Observatory to look at three separate galaxies beyond our own. They looked at a total of 55 systems within the galaxy M51, 
64 systems within Messier 101, and 119 systems in Messier 104, aka the Sombrero Galaxy. But out of all of those systems, they only found this single exoplanet. And if you're thinking to yourself that we've already found plenty of planets and exoplanets, it's true, but they have all been inside our own galaxy. The first exoplanet was found in 1992, and since then, most of them have been discovered within 3,000 light years from ourselves. This newest one is significantly further away. It was only detected by looking at dips in the brightness of X rays. The exoplanet is roughly the size of Saturn. It orbits a black hole, and humans will never, ever step foot on it. But still, it's a fascinating discovery, and it opens the door for more discoveries like it in the future. Giant Earth. Scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, with help from the University of New Mexico, have discovered a new planet much like Earth, except three times larger. It's also pretty close to us, only about 90 light years away. They are calling the new planet TOI 1231b, and it's orbiting a red dwarf. It's about the size of Neptune, has an orbit of just 24 days around its star, and its temperature is almost exactly what it is today on our planet. This is what really makes the discovery so exciting. The planet's atmosphere is about 132 degrees Fahrenheit. That's too hot for us to live, but cool enough for all kinds of other life forms to thrive. It's one of the coolest exoplanets found that scientists are actually able to study because it's so close. Scientists say that there could be clouds in its atmosphere, they've discovered trace evidence of water, and they say the atmosphere itself might be composed of hydrogen helium. Scientists do say the new planet is unique, but it's one of the closest that they've ever found to being a copy of Earth. And if this discovery was made just 90 light years from us, it means the chances of a planet even more similar to Earth somewhere else in the galaxy are extremely good. Ghost Stars Scientists are now saying that the cosmos could be populated by ghost stars, completely invisible to all our modern methods of detection. To understand this a bit better, you need to remember that the only reason we can see stars in the night sky at all is because they are so bright that their light has traveled quadrillions of miles to reach us. But scientists are now saying there could be stars out there that give off no light, meaning they are still there, we just can't see them. They are basically dark rocks giving off no light at all. These huge hunks of cosmic matter are more like celestial shadows, completely transparent, invisible, and unseen to us. And this brings me to another shocking theory that a lot of people might not know. Astronomers believe that most of our universe is invisible. A lot of this has to do with the discovery of objects at the outer edges of our own solar system that move so quickly they should technically be flying off into space. But instead, scientists say these fast-moving objects must be held in place by something unseen, something that provides massive amounts of gravity. These unseen somethings could be ghost stars, invisible to us, yet still producing enough gravity to keep our solar system held together. The Dogbone Asteroid Astronomers recently captured some pretty impressive images of a 168-mile-long asteroid nicknamed the Dogbone. They call it this because, well, it's shaped like a dog bone. It's one of the strangest objects in the entire solar system, located in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Not only is it shaped like a bone, but it's also one of the only asteroids with its own moons. It has a remarkably low density for an object made entirely of metal. Plus, these new images have allowed scientists to discover that the asteroid is spinning so quickly that it seems to be in danger of ripping itself apart. In fact, it's spinning so fast that scientists now believe it may have already broken apart, meaning the two moons that orbit the asteroid could be pieces of itself. This theory is kind of similar to the one that says the moon is actually a piece of our own planet that broke off from us and got stuck in our gravitational pull. Moon Hut China's U-22 rover has spotted a mysterious hut on the far side of the moon. The object is cube-shaped, it's probably just a rock in reality, but in the images sent back by the rover, it looks a lot like a hermit's hut on the horizon. The object in question is about 240 feet from where the rover is sitting now. The rover has been on the moon since January of 2019, exploring the darkest part of our favorite space rock. And while conspiracy theorists immediately littered the internet with all kinds of wild theories, 
such as the object is an ancient structure left behind by a race of aliens that once lived on the moon, that probably isn't what's actually happening. It's going to take the rover another few days to reach the hut, so we're still waiting for that to happen. Then we have to wait for the images to get back to Earth. But in the meantime, scientists are saying the hut-shaped rock is probably just a piece of the moon that was blasted out by an impact sometime in the past. If it really is a hut or some kind of structure, we're all going to be in for a really big surprise. The Chimera The Chimera is a hybrid creature that has changed a lot throughout the centuries. Depending on who you ask, the Chimera might look completely different. The word itself, which translates from Greek as she-goat, should give you a general idea about this horrible monster. But it is much more than a goat. It's said to have the head and body of a lion, the head of a terrifying goat on its back, and a venomous tail that ends as the head of a venomous snake. It's also only supposed to be female. The lion's head can breathe fire, and its snake tail is the head of the snake so that it can bite people. In some versions, the tail is an actual dragon head. Nobody knows exactly where the creature originated from, but most myths agree the chimera was birthed from two monstrous titans, Typhon and Echidna, and was a sister to the Hydra and Cerberus, the famed three-headed dog from Hades' domain. The chimera used to terrify the countryside of Lycia and burn everything until a hero was sent to slay her. The word chimera has come to be known as something that's a mix of different attributes, so many animals are known as chimeras. Even a person can be called a chimera these days. But its origin goes back to Greek mythology, and according to the Greeks, the chimera is one very specific creature. What's really interesting about a lot of the monsters from Greek mythology is that they share similarities with the chimera. They are often hybrids, such as the griffin, pegasus, medusa, and even the minotaur. These are all creatures that share features with different animals, but it just so happens the chimera is one of the most terrifying. Bayzi Bayzi is a rather peculiar mythological beast from Chinese mythology. It's actually a holy beast, with its name translating roughly to white marsh. And as it happens, there is another version of the creature in Japanese mythology called the Kutabe. The physical description of Bai Zi is a little confusing. It's definitely a hybrid, mostly looking like a white ox. But it has nine eyes, three of which are on its human head, and three eyes each on the sides of its ox torso, where there are two more human heads. It is also supposed to be able to grow to be the size of a mountain. Definitely creepy, right? It has two horns sprouting from each of its three heads and a total of 17 mustaches. None of this makes much sense, especially since legend also says that Bai Zi only has a single mouth. One of the biggest sources of controversy is the number of mustaches the monster has. Some say 17, some say 14, and some experts on Chinese mythology even say 33. In any case, Bai Zi is seen as a sign of good luck. It can speak any language it wants, it's extremely intelligent, and some legends even say that the creature knows every single thing in the world. The legend of the beast goes all the way back to 2697 BC, to the tale of the Yellow Emperor. The emperor had climbed a mountain when he came face to face with the creature. During a conversation, the Bai Zi supposedly told the emperor everything that he ever needed to know about the world helping him to continue ruling with great wisdom. The Wendigo There is no mythological creature more terrifying in Native American lore than the Wendigo. It's described as a skinny monster, with its rotten skin pulled tight over its bones. Its complexion was of gray ash, and it looked as though it had been dead for years. Its eyes were pushed into the back of its sockets, glowing fiercely red in the night. It looked like a skeleton that had just been dug out of the grave. It's horribly dirty, its body is usually covered in bursting sores, and it gave off a horrible stench of death, decay, and corruption. It's said to roam through the woods of Minnesota, all throughout the region of the Great Lakes, and even up into Canada. It's hard to say exactly what the creature is, whether it's a spirit or a monster. Some tales say that the Wendigo is nothing more than a ghost that possesses a human body and causes them to become a monster. Pretty much all the North American tribes lived in great fear of the thing. The Wendigo was a cannibal. It had a heart of ice, and it was sometimes even as tall as a tree. It left footprints of blood, it would eat any person who came into its part of the woods, 
and it practiced black magic. But the truth of the Wendigo is that nobody knows exactly where the legend came from. It's just one of those things that has kind of always been around. Some experts believe the story originated because of people who would become stranded in the brutal winters and resort to eating their friends. They made up the myth of the Wendigo to cover up their own cannibalism. The Aluks The Aluks is a creature similar to a goblin and is native to what is now Mexico. However, if you were to ask somebody from Mexico today what an Alux is, they might not have any idea. The creature originated in the Mayan culture in the Yucatan Peninsula and in Guatemala. It was part of the Mayan mythology that emerged sometime around 2000 BC. It lasted until the Mayan civilization collapsed in 900 AD. Because their legends are so old, it's hard to pinpoint exactly which legend is the right one. Some stories say the Alux was a sprite, some say a spirit, and others say a goblin. What all the stories have in common is that the Alux was a mischievous creature. They were created by craftsmen as tiny statues that would later come to life and turn into goblins. What we have here is a Pinocchio-type situation, except that the Aluxes would inherit the personality traits of their creator. Some of the craftsmen who were cruel would incidentally make mischievous Aluxes that tormented people coming out at night to scare children. The only way to pacify these beasts was to give them food, like honey or corn. Cerberus Cerberus is the big bad hound of hell that guards the gate to the underworld. It also prevents the dead from trying to leave. Most of us are familiar with Cerberus as being Hades' pet pup. The great beast is often depicted beside Hades on his throne in the underworld. But Cerberus has a much more colorful history than just being a three-headed canine belonging to the Lord of the Dead. It was a child of Typhon and Echidna, just like other monsters like the Chimera and the Hydra. Typhon was actually considered to be the deadliest monster in all of Greek mythology, as he was the final son of Gaia and Tartarus, created as a final attempt to defeat Zeus during the war between the gods and the Titans. Typhon was a dragon with over 100 heads that could all breathe fire. But all those heads didn't do much good, seeing as Zeus simply struck down Typhon with a thunderbolt and sent him scurrying away. Typhon eventually married Echidna, who became the mother of all monsters. They created Cerberus, the Nemean lion, the Sphinx, and much more. The Cerberus even had a little brother, Orthus, who only had two heads. But here's something pretty much nobody knows. The Cerberus was actually described as having over 50 heads, but when it came to artwork, drawing 50 heads was simply out of the question. It's believed that the description of the Cerberus was altered to have only three heads to make it easier for artists to draw. Huldra In Norse folklore, Huldra is one weird monster. It's a female creature that starts out having long blonde hair, being absolutely beautiful and wearing a crown of flowers. At first glance, she is every man's dream, but then they see the one thing that's wrong with her. Huldra has the tail of a cow sprouting from the bottom of her spine. When Norsemen would witness this creature, they would see her cow tail and run in fear, but not all men ran away. She would sometimes seduce unmarried youngsters, lure them up into the mountains, and then refuse to let them go until they married her. If the man that she tricked and took into the mountains did agree to marry her, preferably in a church and in the presence of God, the beautiful woman would then turn horribly ugly. Sure, her cow tail fell off, but immediately after the ceremony, she was so ugly that people found it difficult just to look at her. And for some bizarre reason, she suddenly gained the strength of 10 men, making her brutish and insanely powerful. To be quite honest, this is one of the strangest Scandinavian myths, as it didn't even really seem to serve any purpose. The Huldra was just all around awful. What do you think the Huldra was inspired by? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more mythological creatures. The Basilisk The Basilisk was a very deadly creature from European mythology and yet another hybrid. The Basilisk was a snake-like monster that hatched from an egg laid by a giant rooster and was then incubated by some kind of mutant toad. Its creation didn't really make much sense, but people were scared of it regardless. The basilisk was able to wither landscapes, breathe death onto people, and kill just by looking at someone. 
One of the earliest descriptions of the basilisk goes back to the famous Roman historian Pliny the Elder, who was known for being something of an exaggerator. He described the basilisk back in 79 AD, but unlike the legends, he said it was only about 12 fingers in length, so only about a foot long. He said the vegetation it crawled through withered and died, and that it emitted a great stench of evil. The Romans believed that the basilisk was native to Libya and that the Sahara Desert was full of these terrible snake-like monsters. They thought basilisks had turned the Sahara from a green wilderness into a barren desert. In truth, it was probably supposed to be a cobra. Somewhere along the line, it got twisted up by the Europeans, who didn't quite understand large venomous snakes. It's also said in the legends that the only creature the basilisk is afraid of is the weasel, which is quite similar to snakes in real life. Weasels and mongooses are notorious snake killers. It was after the collapse of the Roman Empire that the basilisk really grew into the myth we know today. It became less of a small serpent and more of a bizarre hybrid between a monstrous snake and a rooster. The Irish Banshee We've all heard the expression screaming like a banshee, but have you ever wondered what a banshee really is? The banshee is a creature that originated in Irish myth. She goes by many names, such as the Hag of the Mist, the Hag of Blackhead, and a lot of other combinations that include the word hag. She was supposed to be a fairy woman linked directly to the realm of the dead. If you were ever to spot the banshee, you would need to immediately pray for the safety of your family because she was a harbinger of death. Witnessing the banshee typically meant that somebody in your family was about to die. Another nickname given to the banshee was Little Washerwoman. She earned this name because Irishmen used to witness the banshee washing bloodstains out of her clothing just before somebody they loved died. As for how the banshee earned her reputation for a terrible scream, it's because she would sometimes signal her arrival by wailing as loud as she possibly could. Her wailing was so intense that it could shatter glass and break windows. The banshee never actually harmed anybody. She was simply a messenger of doom. When she came, it meant bad things were on the horizon. This is why she was always screaming, weeping, and just being generally noisy. El Coco Coco is another one of those ancient boogeymen, which like monsters, that went by many names. In Hispanic communities, El Coco is known also as Cucuy, Cuco, Cucuy, or Cuca. There is both a male and female version of this mythical monster. And if you happen to have grown up in a Hispanic household, you may have even heard the name mentioned before. The monster was something of an old wives' tale made up to scare disobedient children into behaving properly. Nobody knows exactly what El Coco looks like, but everybody knows it sometimes eats children. At least that's what parents tell their kids when they start acting out. It will either come in at night to immediately devour a child, leaving absolutely no trace of them behind, or it will steal them away to a horrible place where they can never find their way home. And don't worry, El Coco is always looking for disobedient kids. El Coco lives in the neighborhood and is said to hang out on rooftops at night searching for rotten children. El Coco is basically the opposite of a guardian angel, able to take the shape of a shadow to creep inside someone's home and eat their kids. True Dragons Where did dragons come from? No other creature has perforated legends of every single society like the dragon. Yes, they look different depending on which ancient civilization thought them up, but they are all pretty much the same. There are dragons in Europe, China, and in Africa. But the myth of the dragon has a very simple explanation. Ancient people dug up dinosaur bones and mistook them for monsters. Well, it actually wasn't that much of a mistake. If you think about it, dinosaurs are the closest things that have ever existed to real monsters. As far back as the 4th century BC, the Chinese historian Cheng Chu was digging up dinosaur fossils and labeling them as dragon remains. But the origin of dragons goes even beyond dinosaur fossils. Some historians believe the Nile crocodile may have had a hand in inspiring tales of dragons in Europe. Thousands of years ago, the Nile crocodile had a much more extensive range. These dragon-like reptiles had likely swum across the Mediterranean to Italy and Greece. At over 18 feet long, 
They really did look like dragons. People probably mistook crocodiles for mythical monsters, starting legends that grew over time until they became flying beasts spitting fire at castles. It's kind of like how the basilisk went from being a small cobra in the desert to a hybrid serpent slash chicken monster. Thanks for watching! Which of these mythological creatures is your favorite? Which ones do you want to learn more about? Let me know in the comments below and remember to subscribe and come back soon for more amazing videos. See you soon. Bye.